Thank you. Apologies to the members. We can get in there. The next item of business is debate on motion 5282 in the name of Nicola Sturgeon on child tax credit cuts. I would invite all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now. Anna Collin, First Minister, to speak to and move the motion. Presiding officer, I begin by moving the motion in my name. Uh, last Thursday, together with Kezia Dugdale, Willie Rennie, Patrick Harvey and many MSPs from across this chamber, I attended the demonstration against the REAP clause which took place outside this building. At that demonstration, Sandy Brindley of REAP Crisis Scotland said the opposition to the REAP clause is not about party politics, it is about basic human rights and I agree very much with that. Of course, the REAP clause has come about because of the two-child cap introduced three weeks ago by the UK government. That cap means that child tax credits and universal credit will only be paid for two children in each family. Now, I'll talk about the REAP clause in due course, but it is worth noting that the policy intention of these changes, not an inadvertent consequence, but the intention behind them is to reduce the income of low-wage families with children. And the Institute of Fiscal Studies has set out the stark reality of that. 600,000 households across the UK will be £2,500 a year worse off. Another 300,000 households, those with four or more children, will on average be £7,000 a year worse off. Uh, now, the Health Secretary received a letter today from the Department of Work and Pensions, uh, and it says that the reform is to ensure that people in benefits have to make the same choices as those supporting themselves through work. But that really misses the point, does it not? that around two-thirds of these families that will be affected by this policy are working households. They are people who are already participating in the labour market, but on low incomes. And the UK government, therefore, seems to be directly targeting people that it claims to want to help. Now, it's also important to know that these changes are part of a much bigger picture. In total, by 2022, approximately £1 billion a year will have been cut from social security spending in Scotland. Only one fifth of that is the result of the changes that took effect this month. For the past seven years, this Westminster government has systematically reduced vital social security safety nets. For example, by freezing the work allowance, cutting support for housing, and cutting the income of people with disabilities. And let's just reflect on some of the consequences those decisions have had. Sick and disabled people, have seen their incomes reduced by around £30 a week due to cuts in employment and support allowance. Every week right now, around 800 motability vehicles are being removed from disabled people across the UK as a result of changes to personal independence payments, a fact that makes Ruth Davidson's decision yesterday to pose for photographs sitting on a mobility scooter all the more insulting to every disabled person. Young people aged 18 to 21 have also had their financial help with housing costs removed and bereavement payments and widowed parents' allowance have been cut. And of course, more than 70,000 households in Scotland, but for our action, would have been hit by the bedroom tax. More than 80% of those households have at least one adult who is disabled. And that's one reason why the UN has described the UK government's welfare cuts as discriminatory and a systematic violation of disabled people's rights. How shocking is that? The United Nations describing the attack on disabled people's benefits as a systematic violation of their rights. Now, inevitably, these cuts disproportionately affect families on low incomes, those who most need support and assistance. And there is overwhelming evidence that they also disproportionately affect women. As the Women's Budget Group has noted, five-sixths of these cuts uh, that the UK government is making to social security and tax credits will come from women's incomes. Now, it's worth just repeating that. Five-sixths of the impact of these cuts are being borne by women. No government, surely, with a genuine concern for those who just about manage and the women who so often have the responsibility of holding these households together could ever have chosen to reduce the deficit in this way. So the two-child cap on tax credits is in some senses unsurprising, though deeply regrettable, because it is the sort of policy that we have, yes, 
Alice Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful <coughs> to the First Minister for taking the intervention. Is she surprised to learn that this is in fact the second time that the Conservatives have sought to introduce this policy after they were successfully blocked from so doing in the last Parliament? And does she agree with me that this is yet further evidence that the Conservatives have gone too far? First Minister. Uh, no, I'm not surprised uh, to, to hear that because I know that. And I think while I oppose many of these benefit cuts, I think this one, and particularly the rate clause that flows from it, is uh, definitely going too far in the wrong direction. Uh, but it is the sort of policy we have come to expect from this government. But the implications of this policy, as the rate clause so vividly illustrates, are truly abhorrent. You know, the very need to provide an exemption from the two-child cap for women who have been raped shows the callousness of these cuts in the first place. The rape clause is wrong in principle. You know, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, the Equality and Human Rights Commission uh, said just at the end of last week that because of this policy, there is a clear risk of the re-traumatisation of rape survivors. No woman, no woman anywhere should have to prove that she has been raped in order to get tax credits for her child. And I actually can't believe that in 2017, I am having to stand up in the Scottish Parliament and make yeah. that argument. Yeah. But this, this policy isn't just immoral, although it definitely is, it's also unworkable in practice. The proposal for third party verification puts an unacceptable burden on health workers and rape crisis centres, as well as on officials from the Department of Work and Pensions. Rape Crisis Scotland, Scottish Women's Aid, NHS Scotland and many others quite rightly have refused to collude with this clause. And that's one of the reasons why, although it has now passed into law, no one, no one in the UK government is able to explain how it will work in practice. So many basic questions are still completely unanswered. What burden of proof is required? How will the claim be verified and recorded? And how can this process possibly take place without the woman fearing that it will be hugely stigmatising for her and her child. And I would ask Ruth Davidson today not to dodge these detailed questions, but to do what no one has done thus far and to answer these questions. And as she does so, I would ask her to imagine the trauma for any mother already a victim of rape who has to go through such a process. Imagine having to report the most personal and painful information imaginable, then having to go through a process of verification and having that information recorded for years as a condition of one of your financial lifelines. Imagine all of that, because the moment you do, the moment anyone considers all of that, must surely be the moment that the sheer inhumanity of this policy becomes clear. Of course, the Tories' argument today is going to be that we should just ignore the inhumanity of this, that we should just put up with whatever callous cuts the UK government wants to introduce. According to the Tories, instead of arguing for the repeal of policies like the rape clause on grounds of principle and common humanity, the Scottish Government should just apply some sticking plaster. And I want to address that ridiculous argument head on today. Firstly, let's be clear about this. The Scottish Government cannot abolish the two-child cap or the rape clause. We do not have the legal power to do so. And given the complexity of tax credits and universal credit, Trying to mitigate the impact of these cuts would be significantly more complex than simply compensating people for the bedroom tax. But that's not the only issue. The real issue here is the financial impact of mitigation on other services. You see, and this is a key point, when the UK government makes these cuts, they don't pass Scotland's share of the savings on to the Scottish government. If they did, we could make our own choices, whether to reverse the cut or follow the UK government in spending the money elsewhere. But the UK government keeps the money from those savings. So any decision by this government to mitigate one of these cuts involves taking money that is already allocated to schools, to hospitals and to other services. And of course, notwithstanding that, we have mitigated where we can. We shouldn't have to, but we have. Since 2013, this government has spent £350 million mitigating the bedroom tax. And where we control benefits, we do make our own choices. So we won't, for example, apply the two-child cap in our council tax reduction scheme. But we simply cannot accept 
a situation where the Tories can implement whatever heartless cut they want to, and the only answer is for the Scottish Government to take money from elsewhere to plug the gap. Because where does that end? If we accept that argument, there would be nothing to stop the Tories deciding to no longer pay any benefits for people in Scotland, pocket the savings and look to the Scottish Government to step in. It is a ridiculous and unsustainable yeah. argument. So let me, say, let me say this to the Tories today. If you think that the Scottish Parliament is better placed to take these decisions, and I certainly agree with that, then let's forget the sticking plaster approach. Let's devolve control of tax credits and universal credit, and let's devolve the budgets that go with them, and then let us make our own decisions in this Parliament. The fact of the matter is, the only appropriate mitigation here is for the UK Government to abandon the two-child cap, which then renders the rate clause unnecessary. Just as it reversed cuts to tax credits two years ago in the face of mounting protests, it should ditch these policies now. They are unacceptable and they are unworkable. And let me make this clear as well. They are unacceptable and unworkable, not just in Scotland. They are unacceptable and unworkable right across the UK. Now, the Tories, the Tories here had a choice on this issue, a choice of standing up for what is right or simply being a mouthpiece for the UK government in defending the indefensible. The fact that they have chosen the latter, I think, is to their shame. And it does prove that if Scotland is looking for strong voices to protect all that we hold dear, then the last place they should ever look is to the Scottish Conservative Party. Presiding officer, I said at the start of this speech that this is not fundamentally an issue of party politics. It is an issue of human rights and morality. The overwhelming consensus in this chamber demonstrates that fact. Today's vote gives all of us an opportunity to reaffirm that. Uh, to reaffirm that despite the differences we have on so many issues, we all share a basic belief in social justice and we all recognise the importance of humanity, dignity and equality in our social security system. And by doing that, we can add our voice as a parliament, as Scotland's national parliament, to an outcry against the two-child policy and the rape clause that I hope will grow right across the UK. We can take a clear stand against a policy which I would argue has no place in any civilised society. And we can reaffirm this chamber's commitment to progressive values. Presiding officer, for all of these reasons, I urge everyone across this chamber to, su to support today's motion in my name. And I call on Ruth Davidson to speak to the move the amendment in her name. Thank you. Presiding officer, first let me say that I welcome this debate today, not because it's an issue which is easy to discuss in public, uh, something so appalling never is, but because it is only right that issues of difficulty and of passion like this are debated in our parliament here in Edinburgh. And I'd like to begin on a note of consensus. As politicians, I suspect that we all know survivors of rape. Indeed, I know that there are even those among us here who have been subject to sexual violence ourselves and who find the issue and even the word difficult to articulate. And in the last two weeks, as this debate has emerged into the public domain, I know that many of us, me included, have spoken to women who are recovering from their ordeal. We know the awful circumstances that they face, not just the terror of the attack or attacks themselves, but also the indignity of the criminal justice system that makes them and that faces them if they report the crime. The prospect of a protracted court case that follows. The criminal injuries compensation process. And then the lengthy spell afterwards where women, and in some cases men too who've been attacked, have to try to pick up the broken pieces of their lives and confront the world anew. And in the last few weeks, when we've talked about how we should help women in such circumstances, we've used words like sensitive and compassionate. And I agree that these words don't even begin to cut it. They shrivel next to the enormity of the violation that they have suffered. And that is even more so when we face women whose rape has resulted in the birth of a child. Perhaps we don't have the words for it at all, and certainly I struggle to find them. And, presiding officer, I'd like to use my speech here today to try and place this issue in context. The issue of the so-called rape clause arose as a result of the welfare bill passed in the House of Commons in 2015. 
And these changes to welfare spending were introduced in the wake of the 2015 general election when my party set out its manifesto, a clear plan to try and put the UK's public finances back on solid ground. We all know that the UK continues to spend more than it can afford, last year borrowing to the tune of £69 billion. It is the view of these benches that in order to restore public finances, we must eliminate that deficit and then reduce the debt mountain that we as a country has allowed to build up over a period of years. Otherwise, future generations will have to pay our debts. I'm sorry, I have a lot to get through and I won't be taking any interventions. I also don't think that this issue is one that should be subject to the knockabout that we see and hear daily. Now, this, of course, is a political judgment that any government has to take. Labour and the SNP would not seek to curtail the growth in spending as we would, and that is their right. But it is our judgment that we need to reduce this deficit in order to demonstrate that the UK can withstand any future shocks that may come our way and can build an economy which continues to sustain our public services. And this inevitably means, stand sorry, this inevitably means examining many budgets, and the welfare budget is included in that. And it has meant, for example, removing child benefit from higher earners. But the issue that we are debating today revolves around the further decisions taken by the UK Government to limit child tax credits to the first two children. Now, it is worth stressing that this will not apply to existing claimants. In other words, parents of three or more children currently claiming tax credits will, kill, will still continue to do so. But I accept that for many MSPs here, this change is far from welcome. And let me say that these are difficult judgment calls. When in 2015 the UK Government initially proposed cutting tax credits, I spoke out against them. I didn't think the ministers had got the balance right and those measures were scrapped. However, the two-child tax limit was not something that I spoke out against. Indeed, nor did others. I recall then the interim leader of the Labour Party, Harriet Harman, also making clear she felt it was something that should be considered. She said, we're not going to be voting against the welfare bill. We're not going to be opposing the household benefit cap. We're going to be understanding the point about more than three children. I agreed with her then, and I still do. And the First Minister gave monetary examples, so let me put them in context. A one-parent family with two children in which the parent works 16 hours a week at the minimum wage can claim monetary benefits of just under £19,000 a year. Added to salary, and that comes to the equivalent of an earned income of 32,000. And I cite these figures only to give context to the numbers the First Minister gave. This package of reforms was voted through the House of Commons, and I note in passing that many Labour MPs abstained at stage two when they did so. And it was then during the consultation phase, prior to implementation, that the question of exemptions was raised, and it was agreed. For parents of multiple birth, for children who are adopted, and for the rare cases when the birth of a third or subsequent child is a consequence of rape, the UK government agreed that the two-child restriction should not apply. And I support these exemptions. Indeed, I cannot imagine that there is a single member of this chamber who does not. There may be many who disagree with capping child tax credits at the first two children, but not surely with such exemptions to the cap being put in place. So the question then comes to implementation. And I'm sorry to say that on this issue, too many people have simply not been clear with the facts. I have heard members of this chamber say on television that women must complete an eight-page form in order to receive this exemption. And this is simply not correct. On the detail of how this works, may I quote the Department for Work and Pensions consultation response on this matter, published in January. It says, Neither DWP nor HMRC staff will question the claimant about the incident other than to make the claim and receive the supporting evidence from the third party profession. It adds that women are not placed in the position so, of Mr. having Davidson. to give details about the rape to DWP Mr. or Davidson, HMRC sorry, point, officials. Point of, order. point of order, Mr Findlay. I was under the impression that this was a debating chamber in this uh, parliament. And isn't it appalling that we have the leader of the opposition in this parliament unwilling to take a single intervention to defend one of the most heinous policies that we will ever debate in this parliament. She should be ashamed of herself. That is not... That is not a point of order. All members know it is entirely their own discretion whether to take an intervention or not. Ms Davidson. Thank you. There is absolutely no requirement to either report rape as a crime, to provide proof of rape or proof of conviction. A woman writes her name and a third-party professional who is helping the mother is asked to set out the rest. This third-party model already exists in the benefit system 
to support victims of domestic violence. The third party professionals. Order. Order. The member is not taking an intervention. Ms. Davidson. It is important that we are not willfully misrepresenting the process here, causing fear and alarm. So let me outline it again. Let me outline it to the Chamber once again. The woman writes her name and a third party professional who is helping the mother is asked to set out the rest. And this third party model already exists in the benefit system to support victims of domestic violence. The third party professionals such as healthcare or support workers are also able to provide or signpost claimants to additional support. Now, the First Minister in her speech talked directly of workability. Citizens Advice Scotland, who have been critical, very critical of the third child restriction, said the following, and well, let me quote it. Another point of order, Ms Freeman. Order, Presiding Officer, is it not the case in this debate, in any debate in this chamber, that the facts should be clearly represented? Ms Davidson said that the applicant only had to fill out their name and sign the form. I am reading from that form, page 5 of 8, where the applicant is required to put their name, national insurance number, address, declare that I believe the non-consensual conception except applies to my child, give the child's name, sign that and confirm I am not living with the other parent of this child, even if that other parent was the person that raped the applicant. So accuracy in this debate, above all else, surely is in our standing orders. Yes, Thank you. Thank you. I understand the emotions are running high. That was an intervention, not a point of order. Ms. Thank Ms. You. Davidson. I go back and refer to the third party model and to say that it already exists as relates to domestic violence. And it's the third party model being used to fill out the pages of this form. But let me come back to the point the First Minister raised directly in her own speech about workability. Now, Citizens Advice Scotland, who I absolutely accept have been critical of the two child restrictions of this policy has said this about workability. Citizens Advice Scotland is content with a third party evidence model being sufficient to enable the exemption to the two child restriction where it is likely that a child has been conceived as a result of rape. Now, of course, I hear the concerns being raised by other charities in the sector who do not agree with this policy and I take them seriously. And this is why in our amendment today, we also say that the implementation of these exemptions must be closely monitored as we go forward. Now, presiding officer, I'd like to conclude with two points. Firstly, in relation to the First Minister's motion, pointing out the impact of the two-child policy, and I do not dispute the sources she is quoting, but I do ask the Chamber to examine the issue of welfare reform in the round. At the moment, the UK employment rate is the highest on record. In the last year, the number of disabled people in work has increased by nearly 300,000. There are nearly 1.3 million more women employed since 2010. Also since that time, there are 828 fewer workless households. Income inequality in this country has fallen because the incomes of the lowest paid are rising. The latest ONS data showed that the lowest paid workers are seeing their pay go up by the most, by over 6% last year. Median household disposable income for the poorest fifth rose by £700 last year compared to the richest fifth whose incomes fell by £1,000 and we're helping people keep more of what they earn. And because of this, the proportion of people living in relative poverty in this country is near its lowest levels since the 1980s. Since 2010, there are 300,000 fewer people across the UK in poverty and 100,000 fewer children in poverty. And across the UK, we continue to spend 90 billion pounds a year on supporting families, people on low incomes and job seekers. This is the record of the UK government on welfare. And our system means that if people across the UK don't support that, then they have the opportunity to ask someone else to do it on the 8th of June. But for this parliament, the question is deeper. And the question facing us is what is this parliament for? Is it to be a soapbox to sound off against the policies from London that MSPs do not like? Is that what Scottish politics has become? Or given the enormous powers that this parliament now has, is it to act? 
And if there is something that some in this chamber feel is abhorrent or repellent, then surely those words lose all meaning unless there is something behind it. Powers over welfare and the taxation to pay for decisions were demanded and transferred precisely so that devolved Scottish governments could make different choices. I don't believe, I don't believe that any member in this chamber disagrees that women who have children in the very worst of circumstances should be exempted from restrictions on tax credit. I don't want to believe that any member would willfully misrepresent the process, causing fear and alarm. However, I do believe, I do believe that there are many members of other parties who would wish away tax credits being restricted to the first two children, and I would point them to the legislative powers of this parliament. For my own part, I will continue to monitor the way in which this works on the ground. And the First Minister and her ministers uses strong words like shameful, and she has the power to act. And if she chooses strong words but chooses not to act, then that would indeed be shameful. So we will continue to monitor this, and I will move the amendment that is in my name. And I call on Kezia Dugdale to move and speak to the amendment in her name. Thank you, President Officer, and I begin by moving the amendment in my name. Politics is a life we choose because we think we can do some good. More than that, it's because we think that it's our opinions, our views about life are those which should shape the world that we live in, which could help those who feel left behind, forgotten or are struggling, and give them a voice and a belief that their opinions also count. Yes, we are all here in this chamber because we are in the business of doing good. What an ideal. What an absolute joke in the eyes of the Scottish Conservative Party. For 10 years, for 10 years, the Tory government at Westminster has slashed at our valued social security system in a deliberate act of sabotage. And the question I would have put to Ruth Davidson, if she had bothered to take any interventions, is a question of judgment. Tell us why rape victims have to pay the price of the deficit whilst you give tax cuts to the richest people in our society. The disabled. The disabled, the poor, the ill, the carers of our society have all been victims of Tory austerity. And not content with that, the Tories have now turned their grasping, grubby, miserly attention to the tax credit system, one of Labour's finest achievements. Is there no end to the Tories' desire to ensure those with the least have even less? And as the casual victims of this clawing meanness, women who have two children who have had a third as a result of a rape are now at the mercy of the harsh diktats of a government intent on dismantling the vital safety net of benefits. Either admit to being raped and having a child born of this physically, mentally, emotionally scarring crime and get the financial help you need or go without. Without doubt, the Tories' family cap is arbitrary and unfair, and the rape clause which accompanies it is utterly horrific and abhorrent. <laughs> and I look across this chamber at Ruth Davidson and Jackson Carlow and others, and I know that many of them have not always agreed with decisions their own party has taken in Westminster in the past. Yet amongst these so-called different, detoxified Tories, not one of them will speak out against this latest abomination. Not one will stand up and say that asking rape victims to declare on a form that their child was the result of an appalling crime is just wrong. What's worse is they even try and defend it. There is nothing fluffy about David Mundell, a man who cannot answer when asked on radio if he feels comfortable asking rape victims to fill in such a form. A man who then has the brass neck to accuse those of us who abhor this rape clause of playing politics with people's vulnerability and misery. And there is nothing brave about tank driving Ruth Davidson when she fails to tackle her own government on this appalling issue and hides behind a spokesperson for days. But here, is, but here is someone who is brave. I have a letter from a woman who wrote to me to tell her story about a rape and how this barbaric policy would have affected her. I have her permission to read it in full. And I have only removed references to the child's gender and the child's age. 
The Tories may not want to listen to me, but they surely cannot ignore her. This is what she had to say. Four years ago, one of my closest friends, someone I trusted, raped me. It happened once. I used emergency contraception, but still fell pregnant. For lots of reasons, I decided I couldn't terminate the pregnancy and went on to have a baby. The speculation about the father was awful. I accepted that I would be labelled sexually promiscuous as a result. I was prepared for that. I expected and received horrendous treatment from my husband's family. I was prepared for that. I was prepared for the financial hardship having just been made redundant. I was as prepared as I could be for life as a single parent. What I wasn't prepared for was the impact the labelling would have on my three existing children, born into wedlock and brought up in a stable family home. I wasn't prepared for the shame that I would feel. I wasn't prepared for the fear of anyone finding out and refusing to believe me. I wasn't prepared for the feeling that suicide was the only way out. I certainly wasn't prepared for the amount of hatred and resentment that I would feel for my own child. Years on, I have a happy, healthy child. They are worshipped, not just by me, but my extended family, and even better, my husband, a brave and loving man. My child doesn't know where they came from, and if I have anything to do with it, they never will. Nobody knows, aside from me, my husband, and the mental health nurse who helped me through this living hell. Though far from perfect and with challenges of its own, I hope the secrecy will give them the chance to live as close to a normal life as possible. There have been so many pleas to take legal action or to widen the circle of trust to allow those who love me to provide support during the difficult times. But this is a risk I could never take. My need to protect my children from the truth came above all other considerations. The wider the circle of midwives, consultants, family, the less chance I had of protecting myself and my children from the permanent and damaging stigma attached to rape. I claimed tax credits from birth to 11 months old. The hand up I needed when I was at my most vulnerable to allow me to restabilize my family. Tax credits kept our heads above water, a buffer between us and the food bank. For that, I am eternally grateful. There is no way I could complete that awful form of shame, no matter what the consequences. Looking back, that really could have been the thing that tipped me completely over the edge. The difference between surviving to tell the tale or not. That is the reality of the Tory rape clause, or the awful form of shame, as she puts it. That is the burden this Tory government wants to put on victims of rape because it doesn't want to pay for more than two children in a poor family. It is an absolutely sickening state of affairs. But it's not the author of that letter or any other rape victim who should feel shame. It is those on the Tory benches here and in Westminster who refuse to act. I urge every single Tory MSP to stop and think about the ordeal you are asking women to go through. Oppose this clause and finally do some good. I now call on Alison Johnson to speak to and move the amendment in her name. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am grateful that Parliament debates child tax credit cuts this afternoon, though dismayed that such a debate is necessary and that such law has been made by the United Kingdom Parliament through Conservative votes and backing. The Welfare Reform and Work Act, which limits entitlement to the child element of child tax credit and universal credit to a maximum of two children from the 6th of this month, is the latest in an onslaught, and I use that word deliberately, of UK legislation which has negatively impacted women and children. Ruth Davidson, in a desperate defence of the indispensable, indefensible, asks that we look at welfare reform in the round. Well, let's. And gender tells us that of the £26 billion of cuts that will have been implemented between 2010 and 2020, 86% will have been taken from women's incomes. That's the context in which we debate this today. And we were some way away from gender equality before severely gendered austerity was inflicted upon us. In their analysis, the Resolution Foundation conclude 
that the poorest third of households will be worse off from tax and benefit changes starting from the 6th of April, despite a £1 billion giveaway. That giveaway from the public purse sees the better off half of households receive 80% of the tax cut windfall and the poorest third shouldering two thirds, 67% of benefit losses. The overall package of reforms the Resolution Foundation tell us adds up to a significant transfer from low and middle income households to richer ones. Matthew Reid, the Chief Executive of the Children's Society said, the announcement to limit child tax credits to two children is effectively a two-child policy for the poorest families. The Equality and Human Rights Commission, in their letter to the DWP, say that there's no evidence provided to support DWP's assumption that the measures will incentivise families to only have two children if they can't afford to have more. And as we've heard, this policy takes no account of the fact that family situations change, jobs are lost, family members become unwell and require care. Many parents are required to work part-time to care for an older relative. The fact is that the child tax credit limit, along with the overall cap on welfare benefits, fundamentally distorts our means-tested social security system, a system based on assessing people's needs and their ability to meet them. What the child tax credit limit means, that it means that a family will be obsessed, assessed, and even when it's concluded that that family requires additional support, that will be withheld. And the Scottish Children's Commissioner is right when he says that when it comes to new benefit cuts for the UK government, some children appear to matter more than others. And it's no surprise that he's raised concerns regarding the rights of children affected by benefit cuts with the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. Needs will not simply disappear because Westminster has legislated. Now, we've heard that there are several exceptions to the two-child limit including where there's a, multi a multiple birth and in cases of adoption. But let's look at the, the clause that we have discussed today in most detail. Now, I have no way of knowing whether the person who first thought of this exemption, now known as the rape clause, felt that it was a compassionate one. But surely, if you get to the stage where you are asking women to prove that the child they are claiming on behalf of is a result of rape, a single brutal attack perhaps, or conceived during an ongoing, abusive, coercive, controlling relationship, surely you would come to the conclusion that the implications of your legislation, of the impact on the well-being, the privacy of women and children, are completely unacceptable. It will be personally difficult and traumatic for many women to complete this form, and it will be practically difficult, if not impossible, as Scottish Women's Aid and Rape Crisis Scotland wholeheartedly oppose the limit and the exception and cannot and will not collude by acting as third party reporters for the DWP. And the Royal College of Nursing tell us that they weren't approached by the DWP in advance of its consultation on this exception and that they do not believe it is appropriate for a nurse or a midwife to arbitrate whether a child is likely to have been conceived as a result of rape. A requirement for entitlement for the child conceived as a result of rape is that the claimant isn't living with the perpetrator. So those women who are unable to leave a coercive, abusive relationship, who have conceived as a result of rape, will have the same pressing financial need to support a third or more child, but not the means to meet the requirements of this abhorrent clause. This wrong policy makes life even harder for these women. We know from the low reporting rates for rape that many women do not wish to disclose this information. I am wholly supportive of efforts to encourage the reporting of sexual assault and rape, but we know, and we know why, many women are reluctant to take this step. There's so much work yet to be done on this front, but we expect women to fill in detailed forms for the DWP. In their briefing, Scottish Women's Aid and Rape Crisis Scotland tell us, we're in no doubt that this policy will inflict harm on rape survivors. It removes their control over whom and when they speak to about their experience. And this control is known to be a critical element in a woman's recovery from rape. Removing this control risks re-traumatising women. The Equality and Human Rights Commission has written to the DWP explaining their concerns regarding the cap and the operation of this exemption. With regard to the cap, they point out that children have a right to adequate living standards and these are international rights owed by the state to the children themselves. 
These rights aren't dependent on the choices or the circumstances of their parents. And the Commission rightly criticised the DWP for lack of a properly detailed impact assessment. The ongoing cumulative impact of cuts affecting women and children is a scandal and it has to stop. <laughs> now, the Scottish Government has the powers to take action to mitigate, to make something bad less severe, as the dictionary would have it. And of course, the Scottish Government must and will look at ways to ensure support for those affected is available. But I campaigned for a Scottish Parliament. I joined Scotland Forward before I joined the Scottish Green Party. Well, Ruth Davison asks what a, par a, Squ a Scottish Parliament is for. It's not simply to mitigate the policies of the Conservatives at Westminster. <laughs> you know, my vision of devolution is proactive, where politicians in Scotland work together for the good of people in Scotland. Ruth Davidson, Adam Tompkins and others appear to have no vision at all of what this Parliament can be about. I support the SNP motion, the Labour amendment, and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to the open part of the debate. I call Christina McKelvey to be followed by Adam Tompkins. Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, President Officer. I'm profoundly sad to say that these child tax credit cuts yet again show the harsh and cruel nature of this Tory government. A government which always seems to find a new law to stoop to when it comes to attacking the dignity, living conditions and income of the vulnerable. The two child family cap is, and let's be clear about it, nothing less than malevolent social engineering. In December 2014, Ian Tunkin Smith suggested that imposing the cap would help behavioural change. And that's a quote. Think about those words. Help behavioural change. Words that carry the sinister suggestion that poor people should not have the impudence or moral right to breed. He has four children, but then he is rich, a member of the Tory elite, so he's never likely to ever call on the welfare state that he is so much loathing for. It deliberately plants a seed in people's minds that parents on lower incomes are being irresponsible. We might be shocked by this, but we shouldn't be surprised. It is, after all, the latest twist of the knife from a Tory government that already thinks it's OK to tell you where to live, how many bedrooms you can have, whether you get support for your disability, if you can maintain your independence through a mobility car, what and how often you eat or heat your home, whether you are under 25 and you actually get housing support to maintain a roof over your head. And now, how dare, if you might dare to extend your family the worst kind of social engineering, beyond reactionary, beyond unfair, and frankly, presiding officer, beyond belief. But there is one part of this policy which is perhaps the most disgusting thing we have seen from the Tories yet. And I'm talking about the so-called rape clause. Their one exemption to the three strikes and your out tax policy. This clause is nothing less than a barbaric assault on women who have suffered the life-changing consequences of having had a child as a result of non-consensual sex. My tenacious colleague, Alison Hewless MP, found this rape clause buried in the welfare reform some 21 months ago. But this Tory government has ignored all of her calls for sense and even compassion to prevail. Their very own Jackson Carlaw has described the policy as awkward. Awkward for who, Mr Carlaw? for your Tory party hoping to slip this through without the inconvenience of arousing hostile public interests. For you, Ruth Davidson, and your other colleagues now performing excruciating contortions in a bid to sidestep responsibility for this barbarism. Well, I say to Mr Carlaw and Ms Davidson, let the members of your side of your chamber, this chamber hear this. For those who will find themselves trapped, humiliated, and impoverished by this vicious and punitive piece of sophistry, it is a good deal more than awkward. It is devastating. Imagine if you or a member of your family find yourself already having suffered a rape or through domestic violence having to deal with this. To allow the state to use an eight-page form, and yes, it's an eight-page form, to snoop into the deepest recesses 
of your hurt and your trauma. Imagine, if you will, if you didn't report that rape because you just want to bury that awful memory, much like the, the person Kezia Dugdale spoke about. Imagine if you're still living with that abusive partner who raped you. Imagine if you're in Northern Ireland and your application results in a report to the police. Imagine if you are that child named on that form. Well, we don't have to imagine, do we? This is not some dystopian story we are talking about. It's actual government policy. Right here, right now, in this so-called civilised United Kingdom. This is deeper than disgusting. It is deliberate, calculated attack, not just on women who so often bear the brunt of Tory welfare cuts, but on their human rights as well. Yet the Scottish Tories here in this parliament squat down in the bunker and hope the firestorm passes. Ruth Davidson won't even apologise. She won't even explain. She even has the audacity to suggest that this parliament should just mitigate the damage by protecting Scottish families from the mean-minded nastiness of her own party at Westminster. Well, that proves one thing, presiding officer. Where there's muck, there's usually always a brass neck, and there's plenty in here today. Deep revulsion stretches to the horizon and beyond in this policy. Politicians, faith leaders, women's aid, zero tolerance, and gender, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, the trade unions and child poverty campaigners, and even the House of Lords. If Ruth Davidson and her colleagues want us to believe they are capable of even an atom of compassion, they must insist that this corrosive, demeaning, divisive and bitterly unfair legislation is scrapped straight away. Presiding officer, I want to live in a civilised country, a nation that shows its people respect, compassion and care, and not one that treats its needy with suspicion, heartlessness and contempt. I say loud and I say clear today to the Tories, we don't want your child tax credit cuts. We don't want your rape clause here. We don't want it here. We don't want it in the United Kingdom. We don't want it anywhere. Scrap it now. Thank you. I call Adam Tompkins. We're followed by Sandra White. Mr Tompkins, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Survivors of rape have been to hell and back. Their very being has been violated. Women who've reported having been raped will have been subject to the indignities of the criminal justice system and may face the daunting prospect of a protracted court case. They will have experienced shame, isolation, the most complex inner turmoil that most of us cannot even imagine. And these emotions will never fully dissipate during their lifetime. So to say that this is a sensitive subject that must be treated carefully may be true, but it doesn't even begin to cut it. And in the rare cases when the rape results in a conception and the birth of a child, the issues are even more fraught. So this is the context in which I want to place my remarks this afternoon. Presiding officer, no, not at the moment. Presiding officer, one of the first duties of government is the responsible stewardship of the nation's resources. Yet when the Conservatives returned to government in 2010, we found that Gordon Brown's outgoing Labour administration had failed in this regard. Sorry, but there's no money left. That's what we would, no, I'm not going to give away at the moment. That is what we were told. Please sit down, the member's not giving me. Sorry, but there's no money left. That's what we were told in that famous note left in the Treasury. And putting the nation's finances on a sound footing, no, I will not give away at the moment. Putting the nation's finances on a sound footing has been the core mission of Conservative government over the past seven years. Responsible stewardship of the nation's resources is why we turned coalition into majority in 2015, and it's why we'll turn a majority of 12 into a majority many times greater than that on the 8th of June. It's the right thing to do. It's what having an economy that works for everyone means. And getting the balance right between the Ms. responsibilities McDonald, of the taxpayer... Sorry, Deputy... Mr MacDonald, to sit down. Please continue. Getting the balance right, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, between the responsibilities of the taxpayer to contribute and the rights of claimants to benefits is a judgment. All responsible politicians have to make that judgment. Mm -hmm. And it's our judgment that it is the right thing to do to restore fairness in the benefits system between those receiving benefits and those paying for them. With families relying on public support, making the same financial decisions, not at the moment, making the same financial decisions as those supporting themselves solely through work. 
And that is why, from the 1st of April this year, child tax credits are limited to the first two children in a family. This will apply only to new claims. No one currently receiving tax credits will see their benefits reduced. But this is the important point, Deputy Presiding Officer. I readily concede that not everyone will share our judgment that this is the right thing to do. And if a majority of MSPs in this Parliament think that we've got this balance wrong Please and that a different policy would be the right one for Scotland, we have all the powers we need to do something about it. Not to shout and scream, but to act. We have the power to top up any reserved benefit, including child tax credits. And we have the resources to pay for it sit down. if that is what we choose to do. Now, presiding officer, at the same time as deciding that we should limit child tax credits to two children and a family, we immediately saw that there must be exemptions. What if there is a multiple birth? What if uh, the children are adopted uh, from care? And what about those rare cases when a birth is the consequence of a rape? And just as I support the underlying decision to limit child tax credits, so too do I support these exemptions. And because of the issues I referred to at the beginning of my speech, it's obviously the case that the exemption as regards children who are conceived as a result of a rape is extraordinarily sensitive. It is unfortunate, therefore, that there is such misinformation surrounding it. I've heard it said that women will have to prove that they were raped. Not the case. I've heard it said that the exemption will apply only where there has been a conviction for rape. It's not the case. There doesn't even have to have been a charge, never mind a conviction. And even the oft-repeated claim... Minister. And even, even the oft-repeated claim that a woman has to fill in an eight-page form reliving the horror of her assault and violation is not Can true. I ask members, I would like the courtesy of hearing Mr Tompkins, please. Is there more that we can do to support the survivors of rape and sexual assaults in Scotland? Of course there is. Yes, there is. We could, for example, increase the number of sexual assault referral centres. As Annie Wells pointed out earlier this year, there are 43 such centres in England. There are six in Wales. And in the SNP Scotland, there's just one. It's also the case that more than 90% of projects aimed at tackling violence against women and children have suffered cuts in Scottish Government funding. Presiding officer, let me conclude with these remarks. It's sometimes said that the Conservatives target the poor. Well, in a sense, in a sense, in a sense, that's correct. Since 2010, we have lifted 1.3 million lower wage workers out of income tax. At the same time, the national living wage has given a pay rise to 1.7 million people. Our welfare reforms hit higher income families first, not those who are worse off, by removing child benefit from families who pay income tax at the higher rate. And whereas the Labour Party had a lower rate of tax for the very richest in society, Conservatives have ensured that the wealthiest pay a greater share of tax. Under the Conservatives, income inequality is falling. Now, judgments about the relationship of tax to spend, decisions about getting the balance right between the responsibilities of taxpayers to contribute and the rights of claimants to welfare benefits, these are difficult decisions that require tough choices. Limiting child tax credits to the first two children in a family is the right thing to do in stewarding the nation's resources, and exempting some families from this, including in cases of rape, is also the right decision. I support the amendment in Ruth Davidson's name. Thank you, Mr Tompkins. I'd like to hear all members in the debate tense, and I know everybody's committed in this, but I'd like to hear it, and I'd like other members to hear what other members have to say. Sandra White, followed by Alec Cole Hamilton. Ms White, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, like many in here, perhaps not the other side over there, I enter politics because I really do believe in equality and social justice, not to punish the poor and basically reward the rich, which the Tories over here are absolutely doing uh, through the benefit system. I find it very difficult to broach this subject, Presiding Officer, and I want to give you a wee bit of background into to why. I'm a member myself of a large family. Uh, my mother worked part-time, my father worked, he was 73 years of age. And at some times we had to rely on free school meals and the help of friends and uh, family as well. And the reason I'm struggling uh, with this barbaric, disgusting, disgraceful policy 
brought forward by the Tories in Westminster and defended by the Tories across here in the Scottish Parliament. The reason I'm struggling is this policy is really, if it was brought into force when I was born, when my family was born, where would we be now? Where would my family be, my nieces, my nephews, anyone who had more than two children? I'll tell you where we'd be. We would be absolutely struggling, poverty stricken, even though we were hard working families. And that's why I find it really difficult to speak about this. My extended family and the people who are struggling just now, this will make it absolutely worse than ever. People who are in low employment, low wage families, many, many of them, they're no scroungers, they're no in welfare or benefits, they're working hard, really, really hard. And the Tories over here are punishing them, punishing them because they're low paid and basically because they're women as well. And I'll go on to give you some statistics about that. And the thing that you know, I find really, really hard to believe, and it's in the documentation as well, if you've got a third child born after 11.59pm on the 5th of April 2017, then that child is going to be brought up in a family that are poorer, that are struggling, and children that are living in abject poverty. A minute either side, and your family and that child is going to be living in abject poverty. And, you know, a quote from the Tory amendment, the reason for pushing this forward, Ruth Davison's amendment, it says in their amendment, it notes that the UK government has a duty to manage public finances for future generations. What future generations are they protecting? It's not the future generation of families in low pay, and it's not the future generations of women, because that's who they're absolutely destroying and attacking. And I find it absolutely disgraceful that any political party could think up something quite like this. And I said I'd give you facts and figures about the fact that people are not basically benefit scroungers, as they all seem to think they are. In fact, of all in-work families receiving tax credits, 87% of the recipients are women. For in-work single parents, 94% of the recipients were women. In-work, there's the word, in-work, not workless, which itself is an absolutely abomination of a word. In-work families, women, and all they're doing is getting a little helping hand but if something happens to them, and I'll go into the rape clause shortly, but I'd like to put this forward as well. Nobody's mentioned this. What happens if you are taking precautions and the condom happens to burst? Or you happen to be ill and the pill doesn't work? Does it tell you in this eight-page document what you do then? No, it doesn't. So what happens to these families? What happens to these women? who are stuck with that. Have they got to go to their doctor and get a letter saying, oh, I'm sorry, or produce the actual bus condom or something? What happens then? These are things that are absolutely precious to human life. And I'm not talking about kids being born. I'm talking to about the right of people of dignity and respect. And these Tories over here are taking it from them and they're defending that policy. And they should be absolutely ashamed of themselves for not even standing up and sticking up for the ordinary people and women in this country. I wanted to go on to about the rape clause and lots have been said. In fact, Ruth Davison and Adam Tompkins both practically said the same speech. They both mentioned violated. Don't you think that if you go down to the DWP and you fill in this eight-page form, is that not a violation of women's rights? Is that not further violation? And yet you talk about, you defend that. I honestly despair. I thought that some of them were decent people, but if you stand by this, this proposal, there's no decency left in you. Have you read this? Have you seen it even? And I'll particularly talk about Annie Wells. I saw the bit in the paper today where you said you are going to give reasons why you defend this. Annie Wells, you've got relatives that live in the East End of Glasgow. You come from areas yourself where people have got more than two children who are living in low incomes. How can you possibly defend this and go out there in the Glasgow constituency and say you stick up for your working people? Do you know what it says? Do you know what it says at the top of this paper? It says here, we believe in equality and diversity. 
Now, isn't that something, eh? That's what it says in this eight-page form, that people, who, women who have been raped or have been domestically abused have to fill in, we believe in equality and diversity. Well, I just say to you, you don't believe in anything. All you believe is actually looking after yourselves and the rich, and the actual, the poor are the ones that are going to suffer, and particularly women as well. Having to prove you're being raped, you should be ashamed of yourselves. Alec Cole Hamilton to be followed by Ben McPherson. Mr. Cole Hamilton, please. Thank you, Deputy Pre Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by trying, uh, paying tribute to the very moving personal testimony offered by Kes Dugdale and by Sandra White there. I also congratulate the Scottish Government for bringing forward this motion and can assure them of the support of these benches tonight, as we will be supporting both the amendments in the name of Kes Dugdale and that of Alison Johnson as well. Who can forget the inaugural words of Theresa May's tenure as Prime Minister when in her own Francis of Assisi moment on the steps of number 10, she said of those families who in particular rely on tax credits, and I quote, if you're from an ordinary working class family, life is much harder than many people in Westminster realize. You have a job, but you don't always have job security. You have your own home, but you, don't, or you, but you worry about paying a mortgage. You can just about manage, but you worry about the cost of living and getting your kids into a good school. I know you're working around the clock. I know you're doing your best, and I know that sometimes life can be a struggle. The government I lead will be driven not by the interests of the privileged few, but by yours. Presiding officer, in the two-child tax credit cap and the rape clause that underpins it, we see the measure of that commitment made flesh, and I am certain that those words have now turned to ash in her mouth. Now, there are days in this chamber when, I, uh, when we debate matters of welfare reform and social security that I rise to speak with some trepidation, a recognition that there were times when my own party, through dint of coalition, participated in decisions and reforms that were distasteful to us as Liberals, but far less egregious than those originally proposed by our partners. And members opposite, uh, rightly, lose no time in reminding me of that in colourful interventions. Fair enough. But the untold story of our days in coalition is what never made it to the statute books thanks to Liberal Democrat resistance. Regional pay that would penalise any workers outside of the southeast of England. Inheritance tax cuts for millionaires. Enhanced power for employers to sack staff without notice or recourse to tribunal. And presiding officer, as I told the First Minister in my intervention, this abhorrent policy would have been on the statute books for years had my party not taken a stand and blocked it in coalition. At no point has my party ever denied that welfare reform was needed. Indeed, the Poverty Alliance have said for the best part of a decade that the old system was no longer fit for purpose. But on this, as with so many other areas in this agenda, they've got it, the Conservatives have got it far wrong. The policy that we debate this afternoon has like, rightly grabbed national attention through the rape clause, but it is the two-child cap at the root of the policy which will see families drift beneath the breadline. Now, I don't need to remind members that in this chamber that at present the national outrage that is child poverty stands at some 250,000 children or more, and it is rising. Family tax credits have, next to the Lib Dem uplift in the income tax threshold, been the most effective ways of addressing in-work family poverty. I will. I wonder if the Neil member Finley. Thinks, Sorry, Mr. Finley. Neil Finley. Yes. I wonder if the member thinks that even one Tory, even one, will have the dignity, honesty, and self-respect to vote against their party tonight at decision time. Mr. Cole Hamilton. Well, I, I thank uh, Neil Finley for his intervention. I would very much hope so, but sadly, I very much doubt it. As I was saying, that the uh, income tax threshold and uh, tax credits have been the most effective means of addressing in-work family poverty. And with the pound weakening, the cost of living rising, as a result of a Tory hard Brexit, to mount an assault on tax credits now would see those numbers grow still further and far faster. It really does give the lie to the warm words of our new Prime Minister. Now, I describe the two-child cap as the root of the rape clause because the cap could not with exist without the clause. If you were to suggest that such a cap were necessary, and I utterly reject that it is, to bring in such a restriction without any exemptions would be unfair and inhumane 
in and of itself. That is why it is so barbaric, and what is so barbaric, about the notion of determining public policy on the basis of an upward limit on childbearing. Any such policy would inevitably lead, by necessity, to a rape clause. And if a policy necessitates a precondition whereby women must actively prove to an employee of the state or a third party that they have been raped, then such policy has no place in a civilised society. Because, presiding officer, let us speak truthfully about the landscape in which rape survivors currently find themselves in modern Britain. As we have heard, conviction rates of rape cases which reach court stand at just 33%. Put another way, if you enjoy in, endure a rape, one of the most life-shattering, poisonous, dehumanising acts imaginable, and you can get enough evidence to press charges through the courts, you can expect to be believed about, uh, about one-third of the time. Two-thirds of the time, you will not be believed. And against this backdrop, we are asking some of the most vulnerable women in our country those two terrible words that stand between them and sometimes food on the table prove it. We are asking women to reel of the trauma of that experience, in some cases years after the fact, where they might not for many reasons have reported the matter to authority, authorities, but through sheer financial hardship must now do so. Where for the first time children, as we have heard, loved to the rafters as they may be, might come to learn the dark and violent origins of their parentage due to a bureaucratic requirement in the DWP and in Whitehall. Presiding officer, there is a human cost to all that we do in this place and in the House of Commons. There are times when economic circumstance might cause us to pa pass policy with which we are uncomfortable and which might cause our people harm. But there is a mace at the centre of this room and engraved on that mace are four words around which we seek to instil humanity in all of the policy that we pass. Those words are wisdom, compassion, integrity and justice and I see none of those in the barbaric policy we rightly condemn in the government motion tonight. Thank you. I call Ben McPherson to be followed by Claire Baker. Mr McPherson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm obligated to remind the Chamber that I am a parliamentary liaison officer to the First Minister of Scotland. A First Minister who is one of four part party political leaders who have led on this matter. One of four leaders in a parliament of five political parties. Because on this issue we've seen real leadership from the First Minister, Kezia Dugdale, Patrick Harvey and Willie Rennie but not from Ruth Davidson, and not, sadly, as yet, from any other members of the Scottish Conservative Party. Because to be a leader, you can't just hold a title, you need to show leadership. To be a leader, you can't just think about your Tory tribe, you need to stand up for what is right. To be a leader, you need to stand up for the human rights of all of the people you represent, not just conform obediently to the UK government and Theresa May by seeking to defend the indefensible. Presiding officer, there are many fundamental problems with the Tories' imposition of the family cap. Most significantly, this senseless policy will increase levels of child poverty and have a disproportionately negative impact on women. As a result of this policy, according to the Child Poverty Action Group, 200,000 additional children will be pushed into poverty across the UK. And according to the IFS, it will negatively affect around 600 families, again, across the UK. That's the population of this city, of Edinburgh. And, presiding officer, it's not only children that the Tory government is turning its back on here. Across the UK, the family cap reveals the truth, that the Tories are hacking away at our benefit system with the full knowledge that their policies will adversely impact women's rights, as argued powerfully by Engender and women's aid. The UK government even admit this themselves in their impact assessment to the Welfare Reform and Work Act 2016, where they state that on an individual basis, women may, will, will, women may be more likely to be affected than men. Around 90% of lone parents are women. A higher proportion of this group are in receipt of child tax credits. Therefore, they are more likely to be affected. So in effect, the UK government feel that they only need to give a cursory nod that women will be disproportionately affected, write a tokenistic impact assessment and then ignore the impact, system, uh, impact the family cap will have on so many. Presiding officer, not only do all of these points make the family cap both illogical and inexcusable, but the policy is also based entirely on a misguided presumption. 
The rape clause has rightly gathered much press attention because people struggle to understand how a political party, how people can take such a callous attitude to other people. Yet we mustn't forget that the family cap is the overarching policy that has led to this outrage. And yet even by the Tory party's absurd moral reasoning, the family cap is based on fundamental flaws. It has been pushed through with absolutely no evidence to support the DWP's assumption that this policy will in any way incentivize families to have only, ha only have two children if they cannot afford to have more. And pushed through this policy was, it was pushed through, and I quote from the Equality and Human Rights Commission, without a sufficiently detailed impact assessment to support proper scrutiny, without any mention of the public sector equality duty, without any mention of how its aims would be achieved, without any mention of how the potential impact of the policy will even be monitored, and without any mention of how adverse impacts identified impl after implementation will be tackled. So in other words, the family cap and the rape clause contained within it is not only immoral and indefensible, but also nonsensical and completely unfounded. Because, presiding officer, the idea that it, it is in any way common for people to have children to claim social security is a damaging and unhelpful myth that politicians should be challenging, not pandering to, and certainly politicians that want to call themselves leaders. This Tory family cap is based on a very misguided and cynical worldview, a false premise about the motivations and circumstances of women and men in our communities. The Tories have completely ignored the fact that any family can be hit by redundancy, illness, separation or widowhood at any time, leading to a significant loss of income. Children are born out of a multiplicity of reasons. What matters then is, yes, how loving and responsible parents are, but also how we as a society help children grow and develop to be all they can be and give all they can give to the common good. And to limit a child's life chances and aspirations based on their parents' level of income is regressive. It is remarkably misguided to imply that a person's ability to raise and care for a family should be based on their bank balance. However, this Tory family cap policy, this policy of ripping away state support for families on lower incomes that need it, is a shameful value, value judgment that does just that. Human rights say that we do not have a hierarchy of humanity. And so to impose an arbitrary and unjust policy like this lacks wisdom, compassion and integrity. And therefore, I urge all fellow MSPs, including Tory MSPs, to think carefully, think carefully about the principles of this parliament before you vote tonight and do what is right. Support the government motion. Reject Ruth Davidson's amendment. Support the Labour and Green amendments and let's all be leaders against this appalling and thoughtless family cap policy and the utterly abhorrent rape clause. Clear Baker, we're followed by Ruth Maguire. Ms Baker, please. Thank you, President Officer, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to contribute to this debate and add my voice to the coalition which is calling for removal of the family cap and campaigning against the introduction of the rape clause. I am grateful to all the organisations who have contacted us before the debate to tell us about the negative impact of these changes and all those who organised and attended the rally outside Parliament last week. I want to recognise the work of Alison Sulis MP on opposition to the rape clause and I have done what I can to support this, including responding to her consultation. The welfare state is created to always support and help people in the most vulnerable and desperate situations. The child tax credit was introduced with a range of measures to tailor and focus welfare support where it was most needed. The system, introduced by a Labour government, was always about supporting families, making work pay and tackling poverty. Creating a welfare system is challenging, but at the heart of that project must be supporting, not punishing people, giving people opportunities, not desperation, and offering hope and stability, not placing people into precarious situations where they can't support themselves or their family. A welfare system that doesn't function properly is one that creates problems in the short term as well as the long term. The growth of food banks and food poverty, poor mental health, poor aspirations, generational unemployment, these are the rewards of a welfare system which is punitive. 
So what will the impact of the family cap be? The Conservative government have argued that it will save money and reduce the welfare budget. But the evidence shows that this is a burden that must fall disproportionately onto women and children. The Engender briefing tells us that 8 to 6 per cent of net savings raised through the UK Government cuts to Social Security and tax credits will come from women's incomes. Women who are lone parents will see a loss of £4,000 a year, a 20 per cent drop in their living standards and a 17 per cent drop in disposable income by 2020. For families with more than two children, it is estimated by the Child Poverty Action Group and IPPR that up to 200,000 children across the UK will be pushed into poverty. Perversely for a Conservative policy, 65% of these families who are affected are working families. It is a policy which they claim encourages family planning, but it doesn't recognise the realities of modern life where families can be hit by redundancy, by illness, by family separation or by widowhood, all impacting on their income, often at times you would least expect it. American states which introduced this policy had to repeal it, recognising that it didn't achieve its objective and it only created greater hardship in their communities. These UK measures are so punitive to disadvantaged and marginalised groups that they risk breaching UN treaties. And the exemption to the rule that the Conservatives have introduced have only caused more concern and alarm. The exemption for women who have a third or subsequent child, a result of non-consensual -con conception, known as the Rape Clause, has created more problems, difficulties and disgust than it has solutions. The UK Government must listen to Scottish Women's Aid and Rape Crisis Scotland when they say that they are in no doubt that this policy will inflict harm on rape survivors. It demonstrates no understanding for women's experience of rape. It fails to appreciate the importance of control of the experience and the information to the survivor. It risks compromising a survivor's trust in services. It exposes the woman and forces her into declaring a highly traumatic, violent experience in order to access support for herself and her children. Furthermore, the policy exemption excludes women who live with their partner ignoring the prevalence of rape within the context of domestic abuse. It doesn't recognise the level of control and abuse that some women are living with in relationships. And at a time when the Scottish Parliament is due to consider legislation on domestic abuse and recognise the prevalence of coercive control, this policy flies in the face of that level of understanding. It also doesn't recognise that disclosure to a third party leaves a woman vulnerable to repercussions from a person who has raped her, who may be her ex-partner, who may be someone that still has contact with her children. It also identifies a child and leaves that child vulnerable and stigmatised. No thought has been given to the reality for women of declaring your child as a result of rape for an amount of money which is important to the financial survival of your family. The role of the third party is hugely problematic and even more challenging in Scotland as organisations are making clear their intention not to provide that role. It places professionals in the role of gatekeeper. They have to verify a person's claims. They basically have to judge whether someone is telling the truth or not, which is a terrible situation in the context of rape for government to be advocating. And the third party has no responsibility or training or expertise to support someone who has revealed trauma. In a strong statement, RCN Scotland have said it does not believe it is appropriate for the nurse or the midwife to arbitrate a woman's claim is consistent with rape. Scottish Women's Aid and Rape Crisis Scotland have announced they will not act as a third party reporter. The policy is in crisis and it is increasingly undeliverable in Scotland. The UK Government has pushed ahead with this policy without considering the negative consequences. Either that or they don't care about the negative impacts, they are so persuaded by their own thinking in the face of contrary evidence. And I hear the Conservatives making their excuses and giving their explanations this afternoon, and I don't buy it. They would make better use of their influence by joining with the rest of us to work to change the mind of the UK Government, rather than trying to justify a policy that will push thousands of children into poverty and penalise women who have already endured traumatic and often violent experiences. Thank you very much. Before I call Ruth Maguire, last three speakers, a tight five minutes each. Ruth Maguire, followed by Rachel Hamilton. Ms Maguire, please. Presiding officer, the last time I spoke on social security in this chamber, the UN had recently condemned Tory welfare reform as being in grave and systematic violation of disabled people's rights. 
I did not think I could feel angrier. I did not think Tory policy could sink any lower. But the two-child cap and associated rape clause that we are debating today marks a new and awful Tory law. The two-cap policy is inherently wrong, grotesquely out of touch with most people's experience of life and misguidedly punitive. Its stated rationale is to create a situation where people on benefits have to make the same choices as those supporting themselves solely through work. What they mean by this, of course, is that people on benefits should not have more children as they can't afford the ones they already have. Presiding officer, this assumes that people choose poverty, that they choose low pay or irregular hours, choose redundancy or choose crisis and pain of family breakup, relationship breakdown, illness or bereavement. It's not only a ridiculous assumption, it's a dangerous one. We can't always plan for these things. We can't predict the future or guarantee our circumstances. The Tories want us to believe in the cruel and nasty notion of the undeserving poor because it suits the nasty agenda of some in their party. Presiding officer, only a privileged few in this chamber will be so wealthy as to have always been cushioned from the bumps in the road. For the rest of us, our welfare system is a safety net to support us in times of hardship and crisis. The Tory party are fundamentally out of touch with the reality of people's lives and they can't be trusted with our social security system. This policy, like many other Tory policies, undermines the contract between the citizen and the state and it further chips away at the safety net of our social security system. It's part of a wider set of ideological reforms which have in common the beliefs that claimants are to blame for their poverty or should be punished for being poor or disabled or ill or women. And of course, no one will be surprised to hear that this abhorrent policy disproportionately damages women and children, with the two-child cap predicted to leave more than 266,000 additional children across the UK in poverty by 2020. And that's before we even get to the rape clause, the most detestable part of a generally loathsome policy. And despite the Tories' best efforts to convince both themselves and us otherwise, there can be no doubt that forcing women to choose between reliving emotional trauma or impoverishment is abhorrent. It's not awkward, presiding officer, it's shamefully abhorrent. <laughs> Ruth Davidson and the Tories are seeking to defend the indefensible. Trusted women's organisations such as Rape Crisis Scotland know how distressing and difficult it is for women to disclose rape. They know the importance of trust and non-judgment in their relationship with women who seek their help. The Scottish Tories claim the rape clause is the most sensitive way to administer the exemption. Let's get real, there is no sensitive way to force a woman to prove she has been raped in order to obtain support to feed her children. Indeed, these women's organisations find the rape clause so morally appalling and so damaging to their role as support organisations that they can't and won't administer it. They won't be used as tools to get the UK government off the hook. They will never participate in something that re-victimises women and children. That would compromise and undermine everything they stand for and believe in. No health professionals are prepared to participate either. The Scottish Tories are well aware of this, but they continue to spread misinformation to the press, to their constituents and in this chamber. They should be ashamed of themselves. It's not always been clear whether the Scottish Tories actually support the policy or whether they're simply unwilling to criticise the UK government. I don't know which is worse, presiding officer. The Tories don't normally shy away from telling us what they think is good and bad for Scotland. If they genuinely agreed with this policy, then they would have debated this afternoon. They would have been extolling its virtues and engaging us with a convincing defence of the rationale behind it. They've not done that this week and I've not heard a peep this afternoon. They've hidden behind spokespeople and tried to convince us that the rape clause is Tory compassion in action. Most staggeringly of all, they've tried to deflect blame and responsibility for this policy onto the Scottish Government, calling on our Parliament to clean up their party's mess and for the people of Scotland to pay twice for Social Security. Some are attempting to defend the indefensible and it's showing we see them. But, presiding officer, I look across there and I also see Tory colleagues who look deeply uncomfortable about this policy. I hope they've been listening carefully to the strength of the arguments that have been made today from right across the chamber against the harmful two-child cap and the rape clause. And some of them will be able to show the courage and the strength to vote with the rest of the parliament against this abhorrent policy. Thank you.
I call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Julian Martin, and Julian Martin will be the last speaker in the open debate. We then move to closing speeches, of course. Ms Hamilton, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In the summer budget of 2015, the Chancellor George Osborne set out his plans for changes to the Welfare Bill. 18 months on, starting on the 6th of April of this year, child tax credits were limited to the first two children in the family. I'd like to note that for those families with three children or more and currently receiving tax benefits, their benefits will not be reduced. I'd also like to set out the reasons for the changes. Firstly, following spiralling spending by a previous Labour administration, concerted efforts have been made by a Conservative government to reduce public deficit and rebalance welfare spend, to restore fairness in the benefit system between those receiving benefits and those paying for them, with families relying on welfare support to make the same financial decisions as those supporting themselves Please solely through wa work. I've only got five minutes, I'm afraid, Jean Freeman. Well, it's fair enough. We've all heard stories from constituents who work and are able to provide for their families, but have to make difficult financial decisions. Child tax credits are a small part of a large jigsaw of welfare reform that aims to protect the most vulnerable in our society. Today we discuss for what is many a sensitive and delicate issue. That is why there are a number of exemptions to protect those at risk. We've already discussed these people who are at risk, children adopted from care and those children living long term with relatives for whom tax credits are important because the alternative would be local authority care. Another exemption is to those who have given birth to children as a result of non-consexual sex. This will ensure victims will not lose tax credit for their families through no fault of their own. And notwithstanding the strength of feeling over changes to the tax credit benefit, member, I'd down, like please. to set the record straight over some of the recent misleading comments made by the SNP and other parties over the last week. With an election looming, it's true. Instead of protecting the vulnerable in our society, the Scottish National Party chose to use the policy to demonise the leader of the Scottish Conservative Party and twist an exemption to help those vulnerable persons into the opposite of what it's meant to achieve. I've got five minutes. No, Please thank sit you. Down. The reality is the SNP and others are choosing to debate an exemption to help people who've experienced something horrific. This debate could be to oppose the child's tax credit being limited to two children. Instead, the government has decided to debate an exemption to that cap, an exemption that would mean that it would not impact every woman, no matter what their circumstances. Deputy Presiding Officer, from the start, the SNP knew they had the power to mitigate the two-child tax credit policy, and thus the exemption, but have chosen to ignore that The member has made it clear she's not taking intervention. These are new powers down. that this M SNP government has, but never uses. On a tour of the States before a New York audi audience, the First Minister set out how Scotland could be different as an independent country, using the so-called rape clause as a point and example. What she failed to do is reveal that her government already has the power to top up UK-wide benefits, such as tax credits. And given the SNP opposition to changes in child's, child's tax credits, surely it would be hypocritical of them not to act. Why has the Scottish Government refused to say whether they would pay child tax credits for three or four children? What does this SNP Government do other than attack the Conservative Government for making tough decisions in difficult times? Yesterday, Spice reported that it would cost £200 million over the next four years to mitigate the cap. This amount of money is less than the £800 million Derek Mackay found down the back of his sofa during his budget negotiations. Will the Scottish Government finally use the powers granted to them? As part of the welfare reform, the Scottish Government has made more decisions that have been effective, cutting income tax by more than £1,000 for typical tax rate payers. No thank you. Increasing the national living wage to give a pay rise to 1.7 million people and making sure work pays. Meanwhile, the Scottish economy is on the brink of recession. Education and health remain neglected by this MP, SNP government. Deputy Presiding Officer, today I have set out the hypocrisy of this SNP government. I've highlighted their failure to come clean over the powers they have to axe ax the tax cr child credit. The Scottish Government consistently claim they do not have enough powers. That independence is necessary to make the changes in Scotland it wishes. The truth is, 
the SNP government have the powers, continually face, fail to use them. Rather, this SNP is continuing on a path of division and will use anything to demonise the main unionist opposition. Thank you. I call Julian Martin. Then I move to closing speeches. Ms Martin, five minutes, please. This hasn't been a debate, has it? There's been no inter interventions taken by any of the Tories. There's been no interventions asked. Um, most of them have been sat on their phones with their heads down. Yeah. This is the last of the opening speeches, and I haven't got much time, but I'm going to give you the opportunity to intervene in me on one condition, that you take this chance to stand up and say, actually, I have been convinced by the arguments put forward by the rest of the benches today, and I am going to stand up for women and families. Any takers? Not one. No. Not one. Over one million children will be affected by this dreadful policy. This policy, they've said, is set to save the UK government one billion per year. How much does tax evasion and avoidance cost the UK a year? 34 billion. Now, when Adam Tompkins talked about that little note, that so-called note that David Cameron reckoned that they found in the Treasury, and it said there's no money left, on the back of it, did it say, get it from the vulnerable, get it from the poorest in society? No, it did not. The UK government agreed to make all laws in accordance with the Convention for the UN Rights of the Child when it was ratified in 1991. And I'd argue that this policy directly contravenes that convention. One, it states, no child should be subject to arbitrary or unlawful interference into their privacy. Yet a mother must confirm to a third party stranger that they have been raped to access funds for their child. Who's that third party? Yeah, you're asking for more centres for support. Well, the centres that exist that provide support to women who have been raped, Rape Crisis and Women's Aid, have refused to have anything to do with your abhorrent policy. Has the government considered the psychological trauma that this will result in as a declaration of the child, either at the point of assessment or later on, on in life? Two, the Convention also states that all women should benefit, all children, sorry, should be benefit from social security. It doesn't say that only the first two children of a family should benefit. And this policy means there's no link between a child's need and the support they get. The UK Social Security Advisory Committee has commented that the DWP faces complex challenges in ensuring that the proposals are delivered in an effective, fair and safe way. And they've flagged up concerns about privacy, the requirement that the woman is not living with the alleged perpetrator and how the third party decision model will work in practice. Even the Church of Scotland have condemned this policy. This clause is as unworkable as it is abhorrent. The Tories say that the family cap will make families think about whether they can afford to have children. There's so much wrong with this statement that I would use up all my time on this alone. Let's just say I agree with Christina McKelvey on that. But assume I've covered all the moral ground around who is the right to procreate, according to the Tories, and jump to this point. Regardless of a family situation at the time of conception, things can and do happen to a family. A parent loses a job, a parent dies, a parent becomes incapacitated, a parent abandons a family, leaving the family to struggle. There are not many families in this country that can go the loss of one wage for more than one month before they encounter severe difficulty. And in the case of families with terminally ill parents or who have just lost a parent, there's the dual assault that's made in them by this Tory UK government who are cutting bereavement support. Last week, one of the architects of Universal Credit, Devin Jelani, got in touch with me. He produced a paper which assesses the impact of tax credits to third and subsequent children. The paper says the two-child limit to tax credits is a set, will set to drive child poverty up by 10% in the next three years. The behavioural impact of the policy remains unclear, but we know that the costs of poverty are significant. The cost of this policy will ultimately fall on the children in the families affected. And he was, of course, talking in terms of the UK population. And this is one of the reasons I take massive exception to the stock response from the Tory benches in this place, this issue. To quote Ruth Davidson last week, if the First Minister does not like the two-child policy, she can change it. Well, aside from the issue of hypocrisy of the Scottish Government being asked yet again to clear up a Tory mess, this is a moral outrage. What of the children and families driven into poverty across the UK? Who's going to speak for them? Who's going to stand up for them? This policy needs to be scrapped at source.
This policy needs to be scrapped for the sake of women, families and children across the UK. And this policy needs to be scrapped for the good of all children subjected to the effects. Thank you. Move to closing speeches. I call Ross Gear to close the green. Six minutes, please, Mr. Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Like colleagues across almost all of this chamber, I'm grateful that we've made time to debate the child tax credit cuts and the rape cause today. Though I can't describe my horror that we have to do so. That the Conservative Party have implemented something so cruel, so utterly revolting, that even their own most extreme members can barely muster a defence. And didn't Ruth Davidson's contribution today expose that so well? The mask that she so carefully constructed to create an acceptable face of her party has well and truly slipped. Ruth Davidson has spent years trying to convince voters that Tories are the nasty party no longer. But when you cut through the tank riding, bagpipe playing bravado, you can see that Miss Davidson is just another cruel member of a cruel party. <laughs> or worse, or worse, that she does disagree, but the famously honest and plain-spoken politician is too cowardly to say so. This is nothing new, though. Time and again, the Tories go after the most vulnerable people in society to impose the costs of austerity on those least able to bear them. Already, they've hammered people with disabilities. While Ruth Davidson is posing on top of mobility scooters, her party's taking away 800 mobility cars a week and leaving disabled people isolated. While she's out there claiming that Theresa May has helped women, the Tory party's forcing rape victims to jump through invasive bureaucratic hurdles just to claim basic support. And as Alison Johnson has mentioned, 86% of the £26 billion worth of cuts either implemented or planned for this decade have or will hit women. The Tories have once again became the party of child poverty. Already nearly one in four children in the UK live in poverty. That's four million in one of the richest countries in the world. Just today, a new report highlights that three million children are at risk of hunger over the school holidays. And now the Child Poverty Action Group estimates that a further 200,000 will enter poverty from this policy alone. But what does that matter when Tory party donors are getting their tax cuts? I'd thought it hard to stoop even lower than what we've already seen with cuts to people with disabilities, cuts which have killed. And yet that's exactly what the Tory party's managed to do. They're content to force women who've been through the horrific trauma of rape to relive it. Now, they danced around that point today, but I'll happily give some of my time to Ruth Davidson if she wishes to clarify. Why, Ruth, do you want survivors of rape to potentially give up their anonymity, to disclose their experience to a complete stranger? Why do you think they need to relive the trauma? Tell me, tell the public, Miss Davidson, why? No, no, well, that's not surprising, is it? Cowardly, but not surprising. There is a clear risk that others they know will find out, friends and family who they may not have wanted to know. There is a risk that their child will find out once they're old enough to understand the welfare system. So much stress and anxiety imposed on vulnerable women and their families. To do what? To take money away from children. That's everything I've ever seen the Tory party as. But rarely has, there, has it been so blatant. This is a policy that undermines basic human rights to privacy, to family life and the rights of children. I'm aware that Alison Thewlis MP, who we must all give her thanks to for leading this campaign, has written to the UN to request another investigation of this Tory government on human rights grounds. This is a UK government that claims third party experts will handle the rape clause sensitively. Yet many women's organisations have ruled themselves out of this role. So has the Royal College of Nursing. They've raised many valid concerns about how this policy would undermine their relationship with the people they're trying to help, it would undermine the vital service that they provide to victims. So again, I'd ask Rachel, Martin, uh, Rachel Hamilton, why are Rape Crisis Scotland, Women's Aid, the Royal College of Nursing, the Child Poverty Action Group, the Equalities and Human Rights Commission, and so, so many others wrong and the Tory party right? Why, Ms. Hamilton? No. No. no, no. Ruth Davidson called for the facts to be clear. I agree. So I have to point out to both Ms. Davidson and Adam Tompkins that they have, and I assume by ignorance rather than malice, made an incorrect statement in this debate. They said you do not need to report rape as a crime to claim tax credit. But that isn't entirely the case. In Northern Ireland, under the 1967 Criminal Law Act, it is mandatory to report serious crime. So what situation will women there now be in? 
the Conservative Party have talked a lot about the powers of this Parliament, powers that they never wanted us to have in the first place, and expect us to act. This Parliament was not designed to simply act as the last line of defence against the cruelty of Conservative governments at Westminster. That is not our role. The role of this Parliament is to improve the lives of the people of Scotland, not to implement desperate last-minute measures to prevent them from getting even worse. Now, some colleagues on the Conservative benches are here because of their belief in the union rather than an enthusiastic Conservatism. I respect that. But is this what you all wanted to spend your parliamentary careers defending? Is this what my colleagues in the west of Scotland, Jamie Green, Maurice Corrie, Maurice Golden and Jackson Carlaw, are really here to do? To defend the rape clause? I don't believe it's why Jackson Carlaw is here, because he admitted this weekend that the policy is awkward. But as Christina McKelvey's pointed out, it may be politically awkward for the Tories, but it is an intolerable trauma for rape victims across this country. <laughs> Policies designed to limit families to two children exist only in a few places. Vietnam, Iran, China, Singapore, and now the UK. So I ask the Conservatives here in the Parliament, do you want to go down in the history of the Scottish Parliament as having voted in defence of this? You were elected on the banner of being a strong opposition. If you cannot oppose the rape cause, what on earth can you oppose? Thank you. I call Pauline McNeill to close for Labour. Six minutes, please, Ms McNeill. Presiding officer, how did the Tories get themselves into a position of defending a clause that is now and forever will be known as the rape clause. How did the Tory leader find herself in full flow this afternoon for I think about two minutes discussing the inadequacies of the criminal justice, justice system for rape victims? How is it that they now find themselves at odds with all the agencies who would be the third parties meant to report and administer it? How is it that any right thinking person could ask the agencies to judge whether a woman has been raped that has not gone to court. You could not make it up. This is absolutely, as many women and men have said in this chamber, if you cannot see it, I, I, really, it's excruciating to watch, to be perfectly truthful with you. It's a full frontal attack on women and women's lives. It's a full frontal attack on the poorest women and it's a full frontal attack on poor women who have been raped. Why can you not see this? Some of the speakers on the other side seem to understand the high sensitivity of a rape victim and I do not doubt that who falls pregnant. But you will not make the jump to trying to understand the insensitivity of asking that woman to complete a forum, to go through the same ordeal again, to come forward and say she was raped. The story that Kezia Dugdale um, taught, well not the story, but the woman who wrote to Kezia Dugdale, I I'm pretty sure there are many women who just would not be prepared to put themselves through it, not just because of the ordeal, but I just don't think they're they, they, they prepared to put themselves through it as a matter of principle. So it's a policy which I think will fail. Reduced to arguing for more sexual assault centres, which I think we would all agree. But really, is that your defence? Interestingly, the Tory motion says that it's designed to protect future generations. I think Sandra White said this. I find that really ironic, to say the least. Because if it had the desired effect, that future generation is certainly going to be a lot smaller, if that's what you believe. And in actual fact, we've had debates in this chamber about the need to grow the population. We've had debates in this parliament about the need Absolutely. in the Brexit debate to support families and the growth of families. And in Scotland, we know that one of the big issues in the economy is the reduction in the population. It's, it's really quite staggeringly. But what you've done, I think, in defending this, is you've completely overshadowed the policy that you're trying, trying to defend in the first place, and that's the two-child policy. The IFS said families can expect to lose about £5,000 of income um, by 2020-21. And they go on to say that 80% reduction in pay is measured by assessing what pay would have been 
if the 2008 crash had not happened. I said recently that wage stagnation has been worse in Britain since the 1830s. And it's that factor which pushes more and more families into poverty. And they are not responsible for the financial crash. I think it was Ben McPherson who said, and I think this is an important point, any one of us can find ourselves in the situation where we are not here, where we are not in the job, or we're made redundant. Any one of us could be in a position where we need child tax credit. The child tax credit system is probably the biggest single measure lifting children out of poor lives and removing it, the child policy in itself, will make sure that thousands of families will find themselves in poverty. It's unfair, but it is also stupid at a time of economic uncertainty. Just to clarify, I mean, we've all seen the forums if, if, in advance of the debate, and this is what it looks like. It's quite clear. You have to complete your name and your national insurance number, give your address, and declare, I believe, the non-conceptual conception exception applies to my child. I think it was Claire Baker and Ruth McPherson that said, uh, so Ruth McGuire said that um, the stigma that could be attached to the unborn child who, who is the child in question in the forum, it, it beggars belief that you would have a government policy uh, that, would, that would encourage this. And on the question of multiple births, I had to read this at least three times to see if I read it. It says, for example, if you already get child tax credit for two or more children and you have twins, you'll get the child element for one of the twins. If you have triplets, you'll get the child element for two of the triplets. I mean, seriously? Seriously. The policy is in crisis. Wherever it started off, can the Tory members not see that it is in crisis? Women who are raped or coerced. A woman who has not had the courage to leave that abusive relationship. What makes you think that she's going to have the courage to come forward and complete this shameful forum? I mean, it's really just unbelievable. So the Parliament has the powers, and I will conclude, presiding officer, to do this. Yes, undoubtedly, it has. Devolution has been a protection in many policies. Rachel Hamilton said that we, the, the other parties, are accusing or trying to demonise the Tories. Well, I think you're making a very good job of it yourselves, to be perfectly honest. You have time to consider... If Theresa May wants to look at those families who are just managing, and do not forget, families who are affected by it are those very families who are just managing. Do the right thing for the country. Do the right thing for women. Do the right thing here in this Scottish Parliament. Speak up for Scottish women. I ask the Tories to reconsider their position on this tonight, this evening, in the vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Donald Cameron to post the Conservative seven minutes. Mr Cameron, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As I close for the Scottish Conservatives in what has been an emotional and passionate debate, I, I would begin by acknowledging that none of us here today can overstate the appalling, brutalising nature of rape as a crime. It is without doubt devastating for the victim, and I simply cannot add to what others across the chamber have said about its traumatic effects. Making any changes to a support system such as tax credits was always going to create fierce discourse. But all of us should bear in mind that we are talking about real people and the effects of policy upon them. And they are not served by partisan politics or by exaggerated statements about how the specific aspects of the new policy will work in practice. Deputy Presiding Officer, I'd like to set a few things straight because some things have been said and continue to be said that require correction or at the very least require to be put in context. One phrase which has been used, which I take issue with, and indeed finds its way into the government motion, is the expression, proving rape. Let me describe what proving rape means to me in the light of working in our criminal courts when first training and then helping prosecute sexual offences as an advocate. To successfully convict an accused of rape, there must be proof beyond reasonable doubt. That's the very highest standard of proof our law can insist upon. It is well known how difficult it is to secure convictions in rape trials. Alec Cole Hamilton gave the statistics. 
But it's worth reminding this chamber what happens when the victim of an alleged rape gives evidence in court. Whilst the court is normally closed to the public and the victim gives evidence, shielded, no, I'm not going to give away. Shielded from the accused. If... Please let's hear the member. Let's hear the member the have the courtesy to hear the public, his arguments. And the victim gives evidence shielded from the accused by screens. She will remain in full view of the jury, not to mention lawyers and staff. She will remain in full view of 15 men and women. You may think that the description of a rape victim giving evidence requires a to whom she will have... Point of order. Point of order, please sit down. Um, I think that um, we're here today to discuss very serious issues. Um, and I don't think that any of us are here today to listen to a lecture about the justice system. We're here to deal with the nonsense of the child cap and the rape clause. Could, Mr. Uh, could the member please address that? Please sit down. I understand the member will be linking this into his points in the debate. Thank you. The, the expression proving rape is what I was um, considering and asking the chamber to, to listen to. But I stress that I make these points not to contrast them with what is required by the policy here. These are plainly different processes with different purposes that cannot properly be compared in practice. But context is critical. And my plea today is for a sense of perspective, however hard that may be, when dealing with such sensitive and complex issues, not just in terms of the substance of the arguments, Please sit down. but in the words we use and the language we deploy. So the government motion is fundamentally wrong when it says the policy will force victims of rape seeking to claim child tax credits to prove to the UK government that their child, third please child, was down. born Mr. as Harvey, a result please sit down. of non-consensual sex. With respect, it does no such thing. No one is forced to do anything by the form, let alone prove to the UK government that a child was born as a result Sorry, of Sorry, just a minute, Mr. Camp. For the avoidance of doubt, it's up to the member whether the attorney takes an intervention. No other, in, no other point. If he doesn't want to take an intervention, he doesn't need to take an intervention. Point of order, Mr Swinney. You will understand, presiding officer, that I, I, I raise this point with great caution, but I, I don't think Mr Cameron had the opportunity to say to Mr Harvey if he was going to accept or reject his point of order. I, may I be so um, presumptuous to say I thought you perhaps jumped in a bit you, early. You are being presumptuous, Mr question. Swinney. Don't tell me my job. I could tell that Mr Cameron was not prepared to take that point of order, and time is tight. If I am wrong, Mr Cameron, would you clarify? Were you going to take that point of order? No, no he wasn't. I accept that. Point of order, Mr Finlay. President officer, the, the President officer of this Parliament is engaging in a, a discussion around parliamentary reform. That is a very important issue. And isn't the behaviour of the Conservative Party in this debate something that the presiding officer should look at because we have the leader of the opposition a professor and an advocate unwilling yep. to take any interventions of anyone in this debate. That brings this that parliament... Is not, um, that is not a point of order, Mr Finlay. Please sit down. I've been here... Please sit down. I asked you to sit down. I've been in this parliament for many, many years and I've been in many debates where members have never taken points of order. It may not be a happy situation. That is a matter for members and I make no comment. Mr Cameron... <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Sir, Presiding Officer. I accept that unequivocally the form requires a declaration by the claimant of child tax credit that the exception applies and that the child in question was born through non conceptual conception, including rape. But that is not proving rape to the UK government. And in terms of the third party professional, let us be clear about what is required here. The third party professional must confirm that having been contacted by the claimant, her circumstances are consistent with it being likely that the child was conceived through an act which another to, uh, by another person to which the claimant did not agree. No. Likewise, that is not proving rape to the UK government. Further, far from being abhorrent, the third party professional model as a means of supporting women is already being used to support victims of domestic abuse and is proven to be effective. Third party professionals support domestic abuse victims and sign them, post them to benefits, such as housing benefits for a refuge. Deputy Presiding Officer, we all know that one of the inevitable aspects of Scottish politics is the relationship 
between Holyrood and Westminster. On these benches, we are all used to the criticism levelled at the UK government over the last seven years. And the times when that criticism was most potent was when a welfare or tax policy was being imposed on Scotland unilaterally without any ability for Scotland to plough a different furrow. In those circumstances, the outrage expressed was understandable, even if there was disagreement about the ultimate direction of travel. But not here. Not with this. As has been said by others, the Scottish Government has the powers at its disposal to change this policy if it chooses. It's time for the Scottish Government to take responsibility. By all means, express outrage. By all means, howl at us. By all means, cry shame. But when you have the power to change this, at Members least have the courage at least have the courage to step up to the plate and offer Scotland an alternative. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Cameron. I call on Angela Conscience to close the Government. Cabinet Secretary, nine minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officers. The Tories may have attempted a more emollient approach today with some more convivial tones. And apparently, it's all just a great misunderstanding or a mendacious misrepresentation by these benches. Or in the words of Jackson Carlaw, it's all just a little bit awkward. Well, Jackson Carlaw, for many years, has been a big champion of the Jewish community. And in the Jewish community, 52% of the community have two or more children. I would suggest to Mr Carlaw that that's a bit awkward. And in the Muslim community, 60% of people have more than two children. And that compares to 30% to the rest of the community. The Tories, in attempting to defend the indefensible, or more accurately, deflect in the Scottish Government, or indeed the last Labour Government. But make no mistake about it, the mask has well and truly slipped. The toxic Tories are back, and they are back with vengeance. Because if they get away with this, if they get away with the rape clause and the two-child policy, they will think that there is no stopping them. Well, in this Parliament, we feel different because the rage and the passion at the injustice on the SNP benches, on the Labour benches, on the Green benches, on the Liberal benches is absolutely palpable. Because in short, presiding officer, the two-child cap on tax credits and universal credit, we shouldn't forget that, and the rape clause are nothing short of a mendacious interference on family life that breaches the human rights of women and their children. Yeah, yeah. And indeed, it turns the clock back on equality and it turns the clock back to the 70s in terms of fighting <laughs> poverty and inequality. But I think for me, worst of all, it represents dog whistle politics of the very worst kind. And we have to ask ourselves, what is it that the UK government are really saying? Are they saying that having more than two children is only for those and such of those? Is it only for the likes of the Deputy First Minister of Scotland to have three children? Is it only for the likes of Professor Tompkins to have four? And is it only for the likes of the presiding officer to have six or seven children? Because what they are saying, and Ruth Maguire hit the nail on the head, is that if you hit upon hard times, become unemployed, don't earn a great wage, that there will be no safety net for your third or subsequent children. What they're saying is that you don't deserve support and that is an assault. It is an assault on the poorest and it's an assault on the poorest that are either in or out of work. And make no mistake about it, the UK government's cuts are having a hugely damaging and disproportionate impact on women <laughs> because we know and the Treasury know that women are twice as dependent on social security as men. And the cuts hit women the hardest. 75% of the cuts since 2010 have come directly from the pockets of women. The two-child limit will impact on 54,000 families the length and breadth of Scotland by 2021 and, as Polly McNeil says, will increase child poverty by 10%. How is this, in the words of the Tory amendment, managing public finances carefully for the future generation? What this is, is balancing the books on the backs of the poor. And as Sandy Brindley from Rape Crisis Scotland say, the last thing a woman needs is to have to face a decision whether to disclose or to be able to feed their children. Do the Tories not understand this or do they just not care? 
and all of this, presiding officer, is an example of what happens when women are missing or underrepresented in the decision-making process. So let me be clear, this parliament is fundamentally opposed to the two-child cap in its entirety. We believe that all children should be supported, not just the first two, and they should be supported if and when their families need it and when their families need it most. And this parliament, I believe, is clear that there are never any circumstances in which it's acceptable for a woman to have to disclose that she has been raped to receive a benefit. And the UK government seem to think it's acceptable to have an eight-page forum with large and emboldened words on the front saying support for a child conceived without your consent. Not a forum that, as Jackson Carlaw told BBC Radio Scotland, would simply mean that women would have to declare to their GP or another health professional the circumstances in which they had conceived their child. Or, indeed, Ruth Davidson's assertion on BBC TV Scotland that all they, the women, have to do is just write their name in a box. And to Donald Cameron, can I say, turn to page two of this eight-page form and you will see what women are asked. They are asked if they have a conviction against them, if the perpetrator has a conviction against them. They are asked if they have received criminal injuries. And if none of the above, they have the indignity of having to seek uh, out a third-party assessor to disclose some of their most uh, innermost uh, and private matters. And let me say to Ruth Davidson, that if a woman has to tell anyone that they have been raped, that they have been abused, that they have been coerced, or that they were in fear of violence or in fear of their lives, it is never ever as simple as case that all they have to do is to write their name. And they must relive that rape. They must relive that abuse, relive that violence. And they must tell a person, no matter how sympathetic they may be, that their child is the result of abuse. Imagine having to put your child's name in that box, because once it's there, you can't take it back. And that is the reality of the rape clause. And let me say, let me say to Jackson Carlaw, Good luck with finding a health professional, a social worker or a third sector organisation who will participate with this ideologically driven nonsense. And let me say to the UK government, I hope you don't even think about laying this upon DWP staff or indeed asking Atos or some other private contractor to do your work for you. Don't even think about going there. And if we turn to page five, Mr Cameron, in this forum, people have to confirm that they are not living with the parent who raped or coerced them. Have the Tories never heard of rape within marriage? Have the Tories never heard of coercive or controlling <coughs> relationships? And the piece de resistance is page seven, where professionals are asked the question, are the claimant's circumstances consistent? Are their claimant circumstances consistent with what? This is dog whistle politics that's gone back to the days of deserving and undeserving women. Uh, briefly, thanks. Monica Thank Lennon. you. I appreciate that, given that I wanted to ask Donald Cameron about this, but clearly the policy today is that they're not allowed uh, to take interventions. If a woman isn't believed, because quite frankly, when we talk about rape and sexual violence, often women are not believed or women are blamed for what's happened to them and asked to justify it and what were they wearing, etc. If a woman isn't believed or she does get the benefits, but later someone makes a complaint and there's going to be an investigation. Because let's face it, we've all had surgeries as councillors or as MSPs, and that's what happens. Has the UK government provided any guidance whatsoever or explanation about how that's going to be dealt with compassionately and in context? Cabinet Secretary. Well, they haven't, and the hard facts of the matter are you can't implement the so-called rape clause exemption compassionately. It is just not possible. And on the point... And on the point of uh, domestic violence, presiding officer, this parliament, and I mean this parliament, uh, has led the way in tackling violence against women and girls. It started with the Labour Liberal Coalition and that work has continued under this government. We have led the way. Now that doesn't mean that there is, is not more to do. We've invested record levels of funding, but it's not right that the Tories should use this as a deflection to try and defend the indefensible and to point away uh, from uh, their own record. Presiding officer, I want you briefly to say something about uh, the issue of uh, mitigation. 
I have never, uh, in all of the debates I've participated in this parliament, I've never demurred from the debate about what more we can do with the powers and resources that we have, and I never will. But in fairness, we need to acknowledge some things. And as Alison Johnston says, mitigation, mitigation is about making something less severe. It is not to reverse, stop or change. And Julian Martin was absolutely right that this should be stopped at source, not just for women in Scotland, but for women and children across uh, the UK. And it is always worth remembering what we already mitigate. Since 2013-14, we've invested over £350 million to fully mitigate the bedroom tax. We've helped over 241,000 individual households, a third of whom have children, through the Scottish <coughs> welfare. And we've invested a billion pounds in the council tax reduction scheme, helping almost half a million households each year uh, to meet their council tax. So when will the Tories stop expecting us to pick up the pieces? When will they do that? When will they stop treating this parliament as a handmaiden, as, as a handmaiden that has to pick up the pieces uh, of broken lives? And Kezia Dugdale was right. She said that the purpose of this parliament was about making a difference, it was about giving people hope, it was about giving people a lifeline, and it was about giving people a voice. So tonight, presiding officer, we should not and must not let the Tories off the hook with regards to their responsibilities. Because in 2015, when cuts to child tax credits and the imposition of the two-child limit were announced by George Osborne, Ruth Davison made a big deal about how she wasn't afraid to stand up to London ministers. She even said that if there was a, a real practical human problem, and then that the government needed to look at that again. Well, we have a real practical human problem. We have a problem now, and it needs to stop. And it's always a significant moment, presiding officer, when the SNP, Labour, Greens and Liberals stand united against the Tories, irrespective of our differences, whether we're a nationalist, a unionist, or a federalist, or something else, we are all united in opposing the two-child cap and the abhorrent rape clause as anti-women, anti-child, anti-family, and fundamentally wicked. And Ruth Davidson says that the Tory government has a mandate. Well, they don't have a mandate in this place, and they're not doing this in our name. So now is Ruth Davidson the Tories' opportunity to stop digging, to stop deflecting, do the right thing, stand up for women, stand up for children, stand up for families across the United Kingdom and join us and demand that the UK government rip up the rape clause. Thank you. That, uh, that concludes the debate on child tax credit cuts. And I'll allow a few minutes for the front benches to change places for the next debate. Thank you.